to turn with us to the Gospel of John and chapter 17. John 17. This is the Lord's intercessory prayer on behalf of His disciples. And we want to read verses 11 through 18. Gospel of John chapter 17 and beginning with verse 11. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they uh, may, might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Now our thought this morning that I'd like to share with you and have us think about is that we're in the world but not of the world. And just what does that mean and how does that apply to us? Now, many times in the scriptures, God calls on us to be a separated people. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 52, Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 11 says, Depart ye, depart ye, go out from thence, touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean, that bear the vessels of the Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Second Corinthians chapter 6, And beginning with verse 14, he says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship had righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion had light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Notice also Revelations 18 and verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. In James chapter 4, verse 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. In Ephesians 5.11. Well, let's back up verse 9. Ephesians 5.9. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. 
It says verse 12, For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. And so we see from these and many other scriptures, God calls upon us as his people to come apart from the world, to be a separated people unto the Lord, and not to touch, as he says, the unclean thing, uh, not to uh, have a friendship for the world and the things of the world, and to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Yet Paul also recognizes that we cannot cut off all contact with the world, for we are still in the world. Uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and he's admonishing the believers here, the church at Corinth, because they have one in their number, uh, one of their members that was guilty of uh, fornication. And in chapter 5, verse 11, But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one know not to eat. Uh, well, let's see. Back up one here. Verse 9. I started reading too far down. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then... Must ye needs go out of the world? But I have written unto you uh, not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be, you know, a fornicator or covetous or any of these things. So when Paul was making the application here, he's saying, Now I wrote unto you not to keep company. Uh, and as these scriptures that we've read speak about coming out from among them. Be ye separate, said the Lord. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. But yet Paul is saying here, and he's saying, yet not altogether with the wicked of this world, because then you must needs leave the world. Jesus said, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. And that's what I want us to think about. How is it that we are to be in the world and yet maintain and be separated from it? And I believe there are many things we could look at, and, and Jesus himself is the example. that He was in the world, but he was not of the world. He came and he walked among men. He talked with men. He worked alongside men. But he did so in a way that he maintained who he was and manifested who he was and remained separate from the sin and the error in the world. And in doing so, uh, he made a lot of people very upset with him. And Jesus tells his disciples, not only said, I was in the world, but I'm not of the world. They hated me. I was in the world, but not of it. And they hated me. You're in the world, not of the world, and they'll hate you also. So, you know, do not expect the world to look favorably upon you as a child of God. If you're living for the Lord and living a separated life, the world will not look favorably upon you. In the Gospel of John, chapter 3, and he talks about the condemnation which has come upon this world. Well, men loved darkness rather than light. Light makes manifest. Light reveals that their deeds, their manner of life, their habits, their dress, their language, their activity, are sin and they don't like to have that revealed and so you living a godly life in their presence are bearing light let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works 
But to the lost, that light makes manifest that their works are evil. Now, in this train of thought that we're looking at this morning, and you know, thinking about how that we're in the world but to be separated from the world, and we notice that some have tried to create communes, uh, different ones such as the Mennonites, Brethren, Amish, others have tried to create their own little separate community apart from the world around them and preserve and maintain their, their heritage. But while they may have many admirable traits, yet I think they fail. And now there's still communities among us, but they are dwindling. And this is not really in keeping with the commission that God has given to us as His people. And in trying to preserve those things, they have stagnated. And we need to be careful that we do not make that same mistake, that we do not become stagnant in our attempts to preserve one of the most successful examples, I think, in history is that of the Jewish people. I mean, apart from the Lord's churches. And we'll come to that. But when we think of how the Jewish people, when they were scattered and Jerusalem was destroyed and burnt and, and the nation of Israel ceased to exist and the Jewish people were scattered throughout all the world, all nations, and yet they have been able down through the centuries then to preserve their history, their language, their culture, their heritage. They were in the world. They were in all these countries and yet they maintained and, and in these different countries they were citizens of those countries. They lived as citizens within those communities. They, you know, if they were in Russia, they became Russian. They spoke Russian. They also spoke the Hebrew, and they kept that Hebrew language alive. You know, they were in Russia, they dressed like Russians, they spoke Russian, they were citizens, they, they worked and, and lived under the laws of that country. But they maintained a separation and their identity. And primarily, if you, you look at it down through it, whether it's in Russia or Germany or America or wherever, through the synagogue. In a lot of ways, the synagogue is kind of a prototype of the Lord's church. There's some very distinct differences. But we see in that an example, and I think, that as we look at this question, um, and how the synagogue became the center of the community, uh, wherever they were, uh, yet they maintain that identity. And so I want us to consider that as we look at the biblical concept of living in the world while being separate from the world, not of the world. I believe that we are to be a separated people in our persons and in our homes. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 4 Well, verse 3, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. That every one of you, as a believer, should possess your own vessel, that is your body, in your person, in sanctification. And that very word has the idea of being set apart. We belong to God. We are set apart unto Him. 
He says, what? Know you not? You have been redeemed. You've been bought with a price and you're not your own. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are His. And that's for the idea of sanctification. As we have been purchased and redeemed unto God as His own people, we belong to Him and we're set apart to His glory and to His service as His people, the sheep of His pasture, the subjects of His kingdom, and we're to serve and glorify Him. And so that each one of us, in our person, is to maintain that separation uh, as to, and, and we'll look at this, uh, these areas of separation as to our standards, as to our faith, and as to our practice. And we'll look at that a little bit more. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we have this verse of Scripture which many times is, is quoted. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. We are ambassadors. Now, what does that term imply? Now, an ambassador is someone who is sent to a foreign country to represent his own nation or kingdom. Jesus, I have sent you into the world. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We've been translated at salvation into his glorious kingdom. And that is where our citizenship is. But we are sent into the world. That's why we're not of the world. Our citizenship is elsewhere. Our citizenship is in heaven. But we are sent here as ambassadors to represent God's kingdom. Now, an ambassador and an embassy, if you will, an embassy which is in a foreign country is considered the um, oh, the, is, a sovereign territory of the kingdom that it represents. You know, if we have a, an American embassy in Saudi Arabia, now the kingdom of Saudi Arabia has its own customs, its own laws, and things that they abide by. But within the embassy, that ground is considered the sovereign territory of the United States, and they're under United States law, customs, and so forth. Our persons and our homes is like that embassy. We're in this world, but we're not of it. We're sent as representatives of Jesus Christ and of the kingdom of heaven. And it's not the laws of the land that we live in that hold sovereignty over us, but the laws of his kingdom. Now, any people living amongst another does not seek to offend their laws. And we abide under their laws to the extent that we can. But we are also subject to a higher law. And that's the laws of God's kingdom. And I that is, in a nutshell, the, the, of what Jesus is talking about here and, and that we need to understand and, and learn how to apply to ourselves 
is our relationship. How it is that we are in this world but not of it. We've been changed. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. And that includes our citizenship. We possess a dual citizenship. We got a letter not too long ago from one of our missionaries there in Ireland. And their daughter, Lita, for many years, uh, they've had a, an issue that every year it has to go through the expense and everything of getting a temporary visa. Because Ireland had done away with the land, I forget exactly how they terminate, but basically a foreigner that has the uh, privileges and the rights to be able to own property, a landed immigrant, I think is what they call it. And they did away with that standing. And they finally were able to get her citizenship now as an Irish citizen. So she doesn't have to go through that process every year. At the same time, she is still a citizen of the United States. The United States doesn't necessarily recognize her citizenship as an Irish citizen, maintains her citizenship here. And so she does not lose any of the privileges and rights as a citizen of the United States. She has dual citizenship. She's a citizen of the United States of America, but she lives in Ireland and is a citizen of that country. We, as a child of God, as a believer, have a dual citizenship. Our first citizenship is that of the kingdom of God as a child of God. That is our first and true citizenship. But we're in the world. And so it doesn't make any difference which country you live in as a child of God. Would it be America, the United States, Kenya, Africa, or wherever it may be. When people are saved, whatever country, whatever nation, whatever kindred people, tongue, it may be that they were born of in this world, in the flesh, they have a dual citizenship now with that which is in heaven. And one of the things I want us to notice here uh, when it comes to as a believer in the world and maintaining the standards and things that we have uh, when we come to uh, some of those issues. And we see uh, also that... Um, as the Lord's New Testament church. It's kind of like that embassy. You know, this is the, an autonomous and sovereign entity. Each New Testament church, the head of it is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we operate under the rules and laws of his kingdom that he's laid down for us. And though we are scattered in our homes, we come together, and this is where we come together as a community of saints, not by creating a compound somewhere or a commune that we all live together on, but by coming together in the assembly, in the congregation. And here we're taught, and here we worship, and here we maintain uh, that the standards and the faith and the practice that God has given us, our, our history and our heritage, and these things are important as a people of God. And that has been passed down from generation to generation and will continue to do so until the Lord returns. And this is the importance of it. This is how we as God's people have endured for 2,000 years and have preserved the, our faith and practice down through those generations and in different countries, in different cultures, in different languages, and yet one people because our true citizenship was that of heaven. And so this is how we see ourselves. This is how we see our homes. We are strangers and foreigners in the world. Uh, but we have been sent here with a message and with authority. Because an ambassador has authority. The Lord's New Testament church has authority. 
And he's given us a commission. And Paul speaks about how we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. The world is at enmity with God. It is at war with God. It is in rebellion against its rightful God and king and ruler. And God is sending a message of peace and reconciliation. In that he says, repent and believe the gospel. And thou shalt be saved. Thou shalt be forgiven. And we can become a, a citizen of that kingdom. We have authority to explain to people how they can have their citizenship transferred to the kingdom of God. How they can become a member of the family of God. And we have the authority to do that. He's given us authority in that he has authorized us to preach the gospel the message, the baptism of the uh, of repentance for the remission of sins. Been doing some study on that, the, the, some of the tracts we've written recently or reworded and reworked on baptism and so on. But John's baptism, the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Not that we are baptized for the remission of sins. The remission of sins does isn't attached to the word baptized. It's attached to repentance. We repent and believe the gospel for the remission of sins. But we're baptized in order to identify with that gospel message and identify ourselves as being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ and a citizen of his kingdom. You know, when you stop and think about it, in Acts chapter 8 there where the Ethiopian eunuch was reading uh, from the book of Isaiah, God sent Philip to him. And, and it says that Philip, beginning at the same place there in Isaiah, preached unto him Jesus. And the Ethiopian, in hearing the message about Jesus, says, See, here is water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? Have you ever stopped to think about that? What was it that Philip preached to him? In preaching to him Jesus, he preached to him the gospel. I believe he preached to him the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. You need to repent of your sins that you might have a forgiveness of sins, that you might be a child of God, and then you need to be scripturally baptized to identify yourself as a citizen of God's kingdom. And the eunuch said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? Joseph said, If thou believest, thou mayest. He said, I believe. And so he baptized him. We have the authority. And what that eunuch now became a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. He identified himself. I had a change of citizenship. Humanly speaking, he was still a citizen of. Uh, he was from Ethiopia, but he was a uh, treasurer to uh, Sheba, the kingdom of Sheba, which was a kingdom there in Africa. He was still a citizen there. He still continued in his position in that kingdom. But he was also a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, and he was sent as an ambassador now, representing the kingdom of heaven, to Sheba. And so... We see ourselves in our homes and as a church in this world, but not of it. We're here as ambassadors for Christ, representing the kingdom of heaven. And in our persons, in our home, and in our church, we are sovereign territory of the kingdom of heaven and are to be governed by his laws and his rules while in this world. And in this way, we can preserve and pass on to our next generation uh, these things, uh, our standards, our faith, our practice, our standards as to morals, as to dress, language, behavior, these things, as he said there, to, and Peter uh, said, uh, add to your faith virtue. Virtue has to do with morals. 
what is morally right, how we behave ourselves. And I believe this includes our dress. The Bible teaches us that we're to dress modestly. It doesn't mean that a Christian has to dress as a Western Christian. Just needs to dress modestly. Because Peter, James, and John, or Jesus, or any, any of the other apostles had a three-piece suit or a two-piece suit as we wear today. They didn't wear a white shirt and tie. But they dressed modestly, as did the women of their day. Believers in China, believers in... A lot of times people have the idea as Western missionaries went out and people became Christians, told you had to dress like Westerners. No, that's not necessarily true. You just need to dress modestly. Because I believe every culture has its modest dress and it has its immodest dress. And we're to dress modestly. And modesty has two ideas. One, that we're to cover ourselves. And another is dressed in such a way as not to draw undue attention to ourselves. Uh, you know, the example, image that comes to my mind, a person may be dressed very modestly, such as a woman in a nice dress, but a big hat with feathers and everything on it, you know. What does that do? I said, man, look at me. And, and I have to be careful, because, you know, sometimes us preachers have gotten in the habit of wearing these very colorful shirts and ties and, and almost borders on in months because it's, hey, look at me. Look how bright my tie is. Look how bright my shirt is. And so I need to be careful about those things. Because modest dress, is, not only do we cover our bodies, but we dress in such a way as to not to draw undue attention to ourselves or uh, our anatomy or whatever. You know, we can cover ourselves, but if our clothing is too tight, it still reveals what's underneath, and we need to be careful of those things. Modest dress. Doesn't make any difference what the world thinks is fashionable and what is popular and acceptable in the world, we need to maintain a standard of dress that is modest as befitting a child of God at all times. As to our language, you know, one thing, what is it that one of the first things people want to learn in learning a new language is all their cuss words? Every language has its own bad language within it. We should refrain from that. Uh, the scripture talks about our, our speech seasoned with salt, seasoned with grace. Our words need to encourage people, exhort people, lift people up, not tear people down. And that also is bad language when you speak in derogatory terms of someone that tears them down, tears them down in their person. That's bad language. And we ought to refrain from it. There is an old saying, and it holds a lot of truth. If you can't say something good about somebody, don't say anything. You know, there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, and our behavior and the things that we do. Personal sanctification. We said, and each one of us know how to possess our own vessel, our own person, body, in sanctification and honor. Behave ourselves on. In faith as to doctrine, as to the teachings of the Word of God. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. You know, it's all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for the first thing he mentions is doctrine. Teaching. What does the Bible teach? Doctrine. The scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It is the authoritative word of God. This is I don't know what to compare it to in earthly terms. But this is the book of God's kingdom. This is the law book of his kingdom. This is the, the history and the teaching and the doctrine of God's kingdom. This is our law book. This is our book as God's people. And it's authoritative and we are under obligation to obey its laws, its precepts, its commands. 
as to the teachings of the Word of God and as what it teaches about God, what it teaches about man, about the fall of man, about sin, about the way of salvation, about end times, everything that it speaks on. And we can even expand on that, what it says about creation, what it says about geology, what it says about history. Uh, the, it's just as authoritative as on what some people would term the spiritual things as well. And then as to practice, as to church truth, the ordinances, where he says, teach them to, in Matthew 28, teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says that you keep the ordinances or traditions as I have delivered them unto you. The word observe there has the idea to watch, to keep guard over, to hold fast, to keep. There are two different words in the Greek, but they have some very similar meanings. But then some difference in, in shades of meaning and application. The word keep means to keep, hold fast, to retain. And so observe has the idea of to, to keep guard over, to watch over, to keep a guard, to, uh, to observe and to do those things that he's commanded us. While as to keep them has the idea to retain, to hold fast to those things. And so in this way and in, in these areas, we are to be in the world and not of it. And I believe that these, these things includes our history and our heritage. Just as the Jews preserve their history and their heritage and teaching them to their people, each generation needs to understand what does it mean to be a child of God? What does it mean to be a member of His church? What is the history and heritage of the Lord's churches? And I believe that's true Baptist churches. I make no apology for that. I, I believe that. And you, you want to know a little bit further what I believe about you, pick up one of the tracks back there on where did the name Baptist come from. I've got two, a, a short version and a longer version. But it, it goes through some of the, the history and the heritage that we have as the Lord's New Testament churches. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so from that day to this, it has not. So unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. And so there have been true New Testament churches, congregations, assemblies, keeping the ordinances, observing all things that he has commanded in every age down to the present time and will continue till he comes back as in the, uh, the Lord's Supper, where Paul said there in Corinthians, that as often as you do this, that is, you uh, eat this bread, you drink this wine, you do show the Lord's death till He comes. So there will be true New Testament churches observing the Lord's Supper in the proper way, the proper authority, till He returns. I believe that. Unfortunately, though, Many today, and, and throughout the, the years, have adopted <clears throat> the standards, the philosophies, and practices of the world and become one with the world. And that is something that we need to always be on guard against. He says, be ye separate. Come out from among them, be ye separate. We're in the world, but we're not to be of the world or one with the world. We're one with Jesus Christ. We're one with the Father. We're one in His Spirit. We're one with one another. But we're not one with the world. And we need to maintain that separation and that difference. And as I said, I believe we do that through our standards, through our doctrine, through our practice, uh, by remembering our history and our heritage and not be as Esau. Hebrews chapter 12. Book of Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 12. <clears throat> Notice what he says here. He, he admonishes and exhorts us. He says, Wherefore, and he's been talking about uh, chastisement and, and discipline and how that 
it is intended, it says in verse 11, uh, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. He says, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet. So he's telling us to, you know, to keep on, to maintain in the ways that God has taught us. And not to be discouraged, not to faint, but to strengthen ourselves and strengthen our resolve and strengthen our commitment. It make straight paths for your feet. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau. And so now he's bringing up Esau here as an example for us to avoid. Who, for one morsel of meat, sold his birthright. Esau had a brother, Jacob. Jacob had respect unto the birthright. Esau did not. Esau was the firstborn and by tradition should have received the birthright. But in a moment in the flesh and hunger, he sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. Bowl of potch. And he's using the here Esau as an example of believers who, in a moment or in a time of weakness, over a time uh, in this world, compromise with the world and sell out our birthright in order to have the favor of the world to be like the world, to be accepted as being normal to the world's standards. We are not normal to the world's standards. should not seek to be normal in the world's standards. Have no desire for the friendship of the world because that is at enmity with God. Remember, the world is at enmity with God and God has sent us here as ambassadors of peace to preach reconciliation through repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our purpose in being here. Let us not forget that. And we come in a long line of ambassadors who have stood from generation to generation and proclaimed that message and have preserved pure the gospel and the doctrines of Christ throughout all ages to this present time. And it's because of the faithfulness of those forefathers who've gone before, even at the loss of their own lives, the shedding of their own blood, have preserved pure those doctrines and practices and that gospel message that you might hear a true and a pure gospel the gospel of your salvation of your soul. And it is your responsibility to keep and to preserve that pure gospel for those of this generation and the generations to come. Do not sell that for a bit of worldly recognition and acceptance. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. And I hope that we can understand better and how that pertains to us in our personal life, in our homes, and then as we come together into God's house as his people, as his church, assembly, and congregation in this world. Let us stand together.